people in that area by way of conducting meetings and uh, what we are looking forward to now is undertaking a resettlement action plan Resettlement, you got to move people from their land to, from their land you want to move them to another place to another place so in order to take that forward you have to undertake a study which we call RAP resettlement action and action plan resettlement and action plan yes so yeah. resettlement action plan action. and then uh, once that has been undertaken, it will have recommendations as to how government has to proceed. Uh, we are expecting these bids to come in by 15th of this month. Bids for what? For the resettlement. Yes. Uh, for for service. Service. Yeah. yeah, for resettlement. And then uh, by 15th January, we should have awarded this contract to the consultant. Has it been advertised? Yes, it was advertised on uh, November 1st right. uh, this year. Okay, so how many people are you moving this time? Uh, it, I don't have uh, a solid number, but uh, appro approximately 300 uh, households. 300 households, uh, that's not a very big number. Yeah, it's how much land is there? The land is uh, about uh, 50 hectares. Well, that's a tiny plot for the refinery. Yeah, 50 hectares means you combine about uh, 50 football grounds. That's yeah. the tiny plot. It's not a huge. Yeah, it's not very huge. All right. And, uh, and so there's and not too much disruption there. Mm. Let's talk about the pipeline, Gloria. Who is going to build us a pipeline to take the oil out? Because we can't consume all of it here. Uh, that is uh, issues to do with the pipeline would be something that to discuss in the long term after depending on the production rates but right now the pipeline we can talk about is uh, the pipelines that will transport crude from the fields where it has been discovered up to the refinery and then pipeline that would transport uh, refined products from the refinery to the markets and in that in uh, regard to those pipeline the pipelines a study for the first phase which is a pipeline to transport crude from the fields to the refinery is being undertaken it is important that uh, the work being undertaken is done in a systematic manner so that once we have the pipeline in place we are not like now how will the crude reach there right. so that is why a study for that pipeline is being undertaken so how far is the, the uh, refinery from the fields? Of course there are diverse fields, Yeah. but what is the average distance? Uh, well, what's the longest distance? Probably, it is not easy to estimate from here, but we can talk about the, the nearest could be about 40 kilometers. The nearest point is 40 kilometers, yes. so you need lengthy pipelines. Yes. Are they above ground or underground? Uh, just they, they, they can be buried underground. They can Are they in principle going to be buried? Because that's the impression we seem to have. Yes, yes. Also, yes, but all those recommendations will come in the studies she's yeah. talking about. But let me make a clarification. Uh, the pipelines we are talking about hmm. can be two types. There is one conceptual pipeline which people usually think about uh, this long distance for export of crude. Yes. Uh, the feasibility study I talked about. Uh, did a comparative analysis in terms of economics uh, whether uh, a pe uh, an export pipeline would be more profitable than a refinery or vice versa yes. and it was established that it is more economical uh, for us to refine the crude oil and here. sell a finished product yeah so we shall not be having an export pipeline well i think the that's pipelines that's she's talking about that's are clear. those so basically for refining taking from the fields. but we know that total italian that the italian company wants to build a pipeline i think they presented a proposal to connect us to southern sudan and then there's another indian company which at the weekend is uh, said they want to build a pipeline who's who are you going to choose uh, I don't think I can comment on those proposals because they have not yet been evaluated by ourselves. But also, uh, if they are presenting a proposal 
to take out to crude oil. That's no, it's not basically a, taking out refined oil. And Total was saying they want to combine it with South Sudan oil, bring it here, then take it to Mombasa for export after it's been refined. Okay. So uh, we shall look at the technical proposals, and definitely the best proposal will be taken forward. I'm not the agent. I'm only telling you what <laughs> is probably somewhere in the public domain. Gloria, uh, there is this 800,000 barrels of crude oil. We have reports that uh, have indicated that you're stuck with up to almost a million barrels of crude oil, which you need to sell off. Who's going to buy it? Uh, Edmond, I think what you're referring to is the crude oil that has been produced through extended well testing. And uh, extended well testing is the normal practice in the oil and gas industry. It is part of the appraisal process for after you have made discoveries. Uh, this extended well testing uh, is carried out and oil is produced for a short period of time and it mainly gives improved understanding of the volumes of oil and the appropriate methods to produce this oil. So it is uh, a minimum amount of oil that is produced and currently uh, the oil that has been produced from extended well testing is being stored on site as the uh, government and the oil companies finish negotiations with the companies that can use this oil to replace the heavy fuel oils that they use for power generation. So another thing to note is that uh, some of this crude oil, in addition to gas from one of our discoveries, one of the discoveries made, that is the Nzizi discovery, is a gas discovery, and some of this test crude and gas will be used uh, to generate electricity through an in integrated power project. So as we speak now, some of these companies that have expressed interest in using this oil are also uh, realigning their technologies in order to take up this crude oil. So you produced it not knowing who's going to buy it, right? No, there were plans in place. But we're paying a lot of money, you know, for this heavy duty fuel to mm. generate us. Sometimes we don't even have power in the homes. Yeah, but, uh, as I said, it is a process. And as the oil has been produced, these companies are also preparing themselves to use this crude oil and we believe in the coming years 2012-2013 this oil will be used uh, together with the gas from Zizi to fuel the integrated power project and also as negotiations between uh, factories like Hema Cement that use heavy fuel oils are in final stages they will also take up some of this crude oil to run their to run power, to generate power. What's the missing link? You have the oil, they have the need. What's missing? As I mentioned, Edmond, uh, they're adjusting their technologies. That's one of the things. In so order the to oil that you have, they, you can't run in their machines at the moment? Uh, no, not at the moment. Yeah, what, uh, what, what's missing? Is it the greasy content of the oil? What is it? Um, Clovis. Uh, what, what is happening, uh, our crude, the nature of our crude is interesting uh, because what he is supposed to happen is that uh, this should be used at those factories as a substitution for heavy fuel oil. But uh, the crude we have is extremely waxy, yes, and it is solid at room temperature, right. and therefore needs readjustments in the configuration of their uh, just be refined, micro refined, yeah, uh, uh, in order to take it up, and that may not be done so easily. We need that a refinery for that, or what? Or no, 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 no. We need it's to just a, 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 adjusting the, the 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 equipment they use. Or they I need to adjust the equipment. Yeah. For instance, uh, there can be provision for preheating, right. which may not have been included in the initial designs. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about other developments. Other than the laws that we are expecting that you mentioned, what other developments should we expect in the long run of glory? Uh, well, both in the short and long run. Yeah. One thing people always ask is, as Ugandans, how are we going to benefit from this sector? Go on. You know, but uh, what we are telling people is that let us not wait for the production to start. For the oil to start flowing, then we start asking for money, where is the revenue going? But even right now, there are many opportunities in the sector. And in this regard, the uh, government commissioned a national content study 
good to, to determine the opportunities that are there in the sector for Ugandans to benefit and also the challenges that these uh, that Ugandans face in coming into the sector. So this study was completed in September 2011 and it's also available to the public and it has a set of recommendations what must businesses do to be more competitive to get these contracts from the oil companies how can they increase their capital bases because you know the oil industry is capital intensive for some of the money running yeah and so the uh, government is going to develop a strategy and plan to implement the recommendations of this study so that we can see more Ugandans participate even at a higher level. Then in addition to that, uh, government has undertaken capacity building through one establishing the Uganda Petroleum Institute at Chigumba to train artisans and technicians and also Macquarie University uh, has a bachelor's program in petroleum geoscience and they are set to start a master's pro program. We realize that these courses are very expensive ones undertaken outside the country so we are bringing the skills closer to home and making them more accessible for Ugandans. Then regarding environment uh, Various initiatives have undertaken. We have done a sensitivity atlas for the Alberta and Graben, which was uh, led by NEMA. And uh, this sensitivity atlas will be will look will uh, be like a benchmark for the sector. It it identifies the different sensitive areas and what might be in those areas to see, to see that. Uh, the activities don't negatively impact our environment. And in addition to this, a strategic environment assessment is being undertaken. A consultant is being brought on board to undertake this assessment that looks at the whole entire Alberta and Graben as a planning area. Then, uh, as Clovis mentioned earlier, we are implementing a national communication strategy for the oil and gas sector. This came out of uh, I need to keep people appraised on the developments that are going forward to avoid any speculation and misin misinformation. Right. Basically to get the word out. Exactly. That's why I have people like you. In the past the civil service never had communications. And of course yes. <laughs> we're going over a break. Listeners, uh, yes, go on, Mr. Yeah, the, in the grand scheme of things, yes. uh, uh, actually she, she missed out to going into development mm -hmm. and production. Uh, that is what everybody is looking forward to and uh, with regard to taking uh, this further step away from exploration uh, government is expected to give uh, production licenses right. upon application okay. by the companies and uh, then we take forward the development and production we'll talk about that and land grabs do you have land grabs land grabs by speculators yes uh, we are handling that very carefully uh, especially through sensitization we have told you people, people not to grab other absolutely people. you preach to them on sunday <laughs> and every day change turn from your bad ways well this is spectrum you can call in now our numbers zero four one four three four eight one 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 zero three one two two six zero three nine zero zero three one two two six one three nine zero when you call in please tell us in name and where you are calling from Spectrum, hello. 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 All right. Okay. Spectrum, hello. There seems to be a problem with that line. It's going to be rectified, and then you'll be able to call in. You can also send, contribute via text. Send, type the word Spectrum. Leave a space. Type the word uh, your question, message, your comment, and send it seven one. Nine seven tonight. How soon is Uganda likely to have the laws that urgently need to manage the oil and gas sector? Spectrum, hello. In in a different way. Spectrum, hello. Okay. Um, apologies as they try to re be able to, uh, to receive your calls before the evening is out. Let's talk a little bit more about environment management. You said earlier, Gloria, that this exploration is taking place in an eco-biodiverse area to a common, an ordinary person. What would that mean? Talk to us about that. Too many birds, too many animals, so many plant species, swamps and so on. What does it mean? Uh, the Albertine Grubbin, which is uh, the area where currently petroleum exploration operations are undertaken, is an area that has 
various environment sensitivities, such as it has national parks, such as the Markshorn Falls National Park, it has uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park, it has various forest reserves in the in the area. So that is why the Alberta and Grabe is a, a, a biodiverse area. And this is recognized in our national oil and gas policy. One of the objectives, I think, which is objective uh, number nine, stresses environment conservation. So we work, we, we work diligently with uh, NEMA, we work with UWA, we work with the That's the Wildlife Authority. Yeah, sorry. We work with the Fisheries Resources Department. We work with the, the Directorate of Water Resources Management. We have the River Nile in that area. We have the Lake Albert. So all these uh, environment institutions have what we call a multi-institutional monitoring team. This monitoring is undertaken at different levels. They have, we have the executive level that has the heads of these different institutions, including the petroleum department that meet on a regular basis to look at how the operations are taking place. Then we have the technical team and the operational teams that monitor on a daily basis. I can tell you NEMA has a dedicated officer for oil and gas and so does the Uganda Wildlife Authority. So these people are on the ground to ensure that as these operations are taking place the environment is protected. All right, Clovis, talk to us about uh, uh, the state of licensing. We know we have Talo. Who else do we have, and when can we have another person coming? Yeah, um, currently we have uh, Talo Oil, uh, Neptune Petroleum, Uganda Limited, and the uh, Dominion, Uganda Limited. Now, Talo Oil originally was in partnership with Heritage Oil and Gas in exploration areas 1 and 3A. Uh, Heritage, uh, towards the end of 2010, opted uh, to sell. Actually, not towards the end of 2010, towards the end of 2009. And in early 2010, uh, Talo expressed interest to take those uh, shares. So subsequently, Heritage sold to Talo, which left Talo with 100% interests in the areas 1, 2, and 3A. Uh, but in uh, approving those transactions, one of the conditions given by the minister was that Tao should be able to bring on board other partners uh, to so that we avoid the monopoly, monopoly situation. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in that regard, Talo proposed Total and Sinoc. Yes, the Chinese uh, group. Yes. So those two companies were expected to come on board uh, earlier, but because of uh, different circumstances, which are not divulging to... Well, Parliament stopped it. Uh, but even before yeah, the government had already stopped it, they are not... We, you know, no, we were in negotiations. We were in what negotiations. happened, you had, even before Parliament moved in, you, the minister, had stopped this uh, signing, the farm down. No, it, we had not stopped it. Well, you had such. not sanctioned it. Yeah, uh, we had not sanctioned because uh, there were a number of things to, to agree on. Like what? Uh, the first uh, and the most important there were negotiations with regard, but though this is a very detailed uh, this, uh, topic yes. uh, when when, when, uh, when Talo formulated the sale and purchase agreements okay, yes. uh, they were based on the production sharing agreements that were running yes and there was, was a dispute heritage. yes there was a dispute where heritage did not want to pay government That's some it. tax yes. and then that resulted in two protracted negotiations and along the way some licenses expired yes but because the sale and purchase agreements were based on those licenses uh, the company needed uh, government uh, uh, government consent with regard to extensions certain extensions Renew of the license uh, over areas so <coughs> excuse me so those negotiations were still ongoing and uh, we are almost reaching a conclusion uh, uh, before our parliament came in to pass those resolutions. So what were you doing before pa government, government passed those resolutions? Parliament? Yes. What were you doing? We were finalizing the negotiations. You are going to renew those contracts? Uh, we were going to extend, extend, the, extend yeah, the minister has uh, 
even though uh, there was a the the, the, the the taxes yeah of course there was a memorandum of understanding which was signed in March and uh, it provided the framework on either party that's a question in London, the controversial. No, that is a different topic altogether because that is heritage. But this MOU was between government and Talo. And Talo. Well, but Talo so inherited agreements with, of, her, that belong of, her. of heritage, yes. But the, the, the tax which was due to be paid by heritage uh, was already agreed to be paid by Talo, and that was the stumbling block. The and taxes uh, that Heritage was supposed to pay, Talo, well, Talo paid them as a matter of convenience because they wanted an agreement, the sale to, from Heritage to be sanctioned. To, to be and, sanctioned, yes. yeah, yeah. So they paid it and they are also going to court to claim it afterwards. Uh, they I don't paid know. 300 million dollars to Heritage, uh, on behalf of Ter Heritage, uh, you know, basically yeah. for convenience so they could get their contracts running. Not for convenience, that is what the Income Tax Act stipulates. Uh, if you have been given notice to act as an agent of someone, you pay their liabilities. Absolutely. So it's within so the law. convenience on their behalf. Not at all. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about opportunities, Gloria. Are you going to publish a big handbook like a directory telling Ugandans what to do? If you're an accountant, this is how you line yourself up. If you're a doctor, this is what you do. Uh, not a book per se, but as well, I people said, need a book to know. If I'm an account, how do I line myself with oil? I'm not interested in oil myself, but as a, if someone is an accountant, how do they get themselves? Positive? Firstly, I think it is. We did the study, so now the study is in place, and now we are publicizing. We're making that study public. We're making it available to the public right now. It can be accessed on our website. What is it called? Uh, www. No, I mean the, the, the petroleum. Geo. Ug. And then the study. study is uh, enhancing national participation in the oil and gas sector in Uganda. What does it contain? It contains, uh, first of all, it looks at uh, the opportunities in the sector. Then it looks at the challenges, the bottlenecks for Ugandans to accessing the, these opportunities and then makes recommendations on how Ugandans can be helped and, and how they can, uh, let's say, upgrade their businesses in order to benefit from these opportunities. Even aside from that, the oil and gas sector is providing various investment opportunities in different areas. Clovis talked about farm down arrangements with oil companies. There are opportunities in service provision. For example, each and every activity project, is it the 64 wells drilled, the over 25 seismic surveys undertaken, each of these requires an environment impact assessment study. Right. And all these studies are being done by Ugandans. Private individuals. Private, private individuals that are sanctioned by NEMA. So people in the energy environment in the environment area, there's a tick against their name. They have, they have, they have been. They are, they are getting opportunities. Who else? Doctor. Then, uh, there, there are employment opportunities in the sector. These are both skilled, semi-skilled, and unskilled. And uh, when you talk about the unskilled, you look at maybe the mainly the casual work for people who do not have the higher qualifications. And these uh, oil companies are required to recruit from within the area where they're operating. Yes. So if they are operating in Hoima and it's a job that does not require certain specialized skill, they are required to recruit from that area. Then we have Ugandans who have gotten higher training in uh, in petroleum geosciences. They are also now being taken on by these companies. Many Ugandans are being studied, both sponsored by government and private sponsored. And then even oil companies are coming up to give scholarships to uh, qualified individuals to undertake these studies. Another opportunity that is in the sector is uh, through the corporate social responsibility that building school rooms. Yeah, they undertake. They support government work by uh, helping provide services to the local community. There are various other opportunities in the sector, and we encourage Ugandans to align themselves to better their businesses. One thing the study found was that there is so much informal business in Uganda. People do not have accounting systems, their companies are not registered, and the nature of the oil industry is that it is formal. It needs a this, if they are to work with a certain company, they have to have these systems in place. So one of the recommendations that came out is that Ugandans need to align their businesses. Right. Those are the things that I think as a country we should 
we start focusing on a little more because that is how the majority of Ugandans will indeed benefit from the sector. We have to go. Thank you very much, Dida. Dear guest, Mr. Clovis Irumba, Petroleum Geochemist at the Petroleum Depart Petroleum Exploration and Production Department in the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development. Thank you very much for coming to Spectrum tonight. Welcome, Edmund. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Gloria Sevikari, Communication Officer at the Petroleum Exploration and Production Department in the same ministry. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you for tuning in. I've been your host, Edmund Chizito. Spectrum will be back tomorrow. Up next is the news in English. Stay tuned. Free internet access for everyone. <laughs>